Hi there. Uh, somehow you've come across this video. Uh, maybe you found it online. Maybe you're scrolling through Facebook and it's just happened to play in front of you. Well, if you're feeling hopeless at the moment or you're feeling overwhelmed by a struggle or a situation that uh, just keeps going and going and it's wearing you out, maybe you've been serving the Lord and um, you're serving him and serving him, but you're, you're really coming to the end of yourself. Well, if that's you, then I'd encourage you just to, to listen on uh, here for a few minutes. I've got some few things to share that would, I think will really, really encourage you. And if you don't have time right now, then I'd encourage you to, when you do have some time later on, um, bookmark this one and come back to it. Um, and I just think that by the end of this, that the Lord's going to use this message to really encourage a number of people and to, to really uh, stir up their hope. I think we're in a time at the moment where our hope is being strangled off. We know that that's not from God, but that's of the enemy. But even though we know that, it can still be very tiring and very exhausting and very disorientating um, as it can cause us really to lose our focus. One of the things the Lord's been speaking to me about for a number of years now is this phrase, it's time for my people to be set free. And like a lot of the times the Lord speaks to me, I think, what on earth does that mean? Um, but about uh, probably this time last year, um, I remember um, having a couple of stories uh, really on my mind. And it was after a little while thinking through these that I realized that the Lord was really trying to say something. So I just want to share a couple of um, these stories with you now. One's, one's from the Bible, another one's from a movie. Um, you probably remember um, back when Abraham was called and the Lord, um, he entered into a covenant with the Lord. Uh, the Lord put him into a, into a sleep or a trance. And the Lord said to Abraham, he said, um, your descendants are going to go into slavery down into Egypt and there they will remain for 400 years. And after 400 years, the Lord says, I will, I will uh, set them free and set them free with all the spoils uh, of Egypt to come back to the land that I have promised you. And we read about that uh, story um, in Exodus. I think it's Exodus 11 and 12, somewhere around there, where... Um, after 430 years, the Bible says to the day, uh, 2.4 million Israelites who were slaves in one day walked out with all the loot of Egypt. 2.4 million people, the whole, uh, them, uh, their parents, their grandparents and ancestors for the last 430 years been in slavery, and now they walk out in one day, 2.4 million people with all the loot of Egypt. God did a work. Now the next story I want to share uh, comes from um, the movie Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. And uh, if you remember the um, second trilogy, it's the first movie of that one. And one of the scenes in this movie is there's a rebel uh, group, if you like, and they've got a, a droid army they're controlling. And there's a droid army on the planet of uh, Tatooine. And the natives are uh, rallied together and they're defending their planet. Now, at this point in time, they're losing the battle to this uh, droid army. Now, the droid army are just that. They're droids. They're robots. And they're controlled uh, by a central ship. A set, and in the central ship, a central control panel. And they're controlled by this control panel. And the droids are winning the battle. And it looks like the droids are going to overcome the natives and this rebel a group is going to take over the planet. 
Now, as this battle is happening on the ground, on the planet, there's another ba battle happening in the control ship. And there's two Jedi there, and the Jedi are making their way to the control room. And the, the Jedi fight their way in, and they fight their way into the control room. And when they get there, they destroy the controls um, in the ship that's controlling the droid army on the ground. And the moment they destroy the controls, every droid on the planet instantly becomes lifeless. And the scene is, is the, the droids are battling away uh, with the natives and the natives are being overcome. Um, but just in an instant, suddenly, um, the, the people, the inhabitants, the natives of Tatooine, um, realize the droids have become lifeless and literally dead on their feet. And in a moment, uh, the battle is won. And that's the, the common thing um, through both of these stories, that in a moment, there was great and decisive uh, breakthrough. In a moment, there was great uh, and decisive a turnaround and victory. Now, if you're watching this video and you don't currently live um, in a developing nation or a majority world nation, uh, you along with myself are uh, amongst the generation that is the richest generation in the history of the world. We live in uh, Big houses, um, historically speaking, even if you think you live in a small house, uh, for thousands of years people lived in huts and shacks and uh, houses with one or two rooms, whole family crammed in. Uh, we've got running water, we've got electricity, we've got internet, we've got uh, cars. We live in a day and age where a lot of people have their own cars, not just a family car, but their own car. We've got cheap air flights, we can fly, not during the coronavirus of course, but Generally speaking, we can jump on a plane and fly almost anywhere in the world. Uh, we've got f fast food, our, our needs are at our fingertips, we've got convenience. In all these ways, we, we are incredibly, incredibly rich here in the Western world. Yet, in so many other ways, we are broke. We are flat broke. Um, just to mention some of the reasons that if you're watching this, you're, you'd be more uh, than aware of. I mean, the number one uh, reason why people go see their GP, go to the doctor, uh, is because of some sort of mental health um, condition. Whether it be depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, and these rates are steadily and continually rising. If you yourself haven't been dragged through the family court in this country, you more than likely know someone that has. Um, a little while ago, before all these restrictions came down, I had to go see a, a community lawyer about a particular matter. And uh, I was lining up there and uh, there was just throngs and throngs of people. And I thought, oh my gosh, this service is overrun. And I got to see um, one of the fellows there, one of the community uh, guys doing his, his law firm hours there. And I said, um, what's with all the people? And he said, family law. It's all family law matters. And our society as a family unit has just deteriorated. Um, there's breakdown everywhere. And... Um, there's single parents trying to do the, the best they can. And there's uh, families that have, you know, staying the course and staying together. and But the family is under assault um, from all angles. And it's a really uh, hard time um, to be alive at this point in time and try to adhere to uh, family values and what would have been considered in the past family norms. We're constantly busy. Uh, 
running around, rushing around from one thing to the next, trying to pay bills, uh, trying to keep all the balls in the air. Uh, we've got children um, more and more numerously, exponentially getting diagnosed with um, behavioural difficulties and learning difficulties. And these are just some of the things that um, make modern life very challenging. And some of the things, along with many others, that are making more and more people feel like they can't cope and feel like that there's um, no end in sight. It's like the, the frog being boiled ever so slowly in the water. The temperature gets turned up more and more and more and more. And it just seems for a lot of us that we get through one challenge only to come up against another bigger, longer and harder one. Even now, as you're watching this, um, you'd be no doubt aware there's a lot of fear around um, with this coronavirus. Uh, there seems to be those who are fearful um, of contracting the virus itself. Um, there are others who are fearful uh, for their employment and fearful of economic collapse. Um, and then there are others who are fearful of the powers uh, that our government sees it, seems to be seizing uh, and exercising unprecedented powers here at this stage. And so that on top of a lot of additional uh, challenges um, is enough to, over time, um, feel steadily beaten down. And if you've received a promise from the Lord, if you've had a uh, uh, something on your heart, you've, you've felt called by the Lord at, at some time in the past, you know, and you're hanging on and and you've, you've cho chosen to believe that word, yet over time, yet over years, sometimes longer, it just seems uh, like most things in your life are going the opposite direction um, to what you believed uh, God had called you to or shown to you or promised you. And I just want to bring up a scripture right now that the Lord gave me in the middle of 2018, and it's in Romans. And the scripture is this, it says, Abraham, against all hope, in hope, believed God and so became the father of of many nations and if you know a bit about the story of Abraham and the promise God gave to him uh, God said to Abraham that you would have uh, sons and daughters that you would have uh, descendants that could not be numbered that be as the grains of sand on the seashore and God had promised this to Abraham by oath, and yet here Abraham is in his 80s and 90s uh, with a wife of similar age, and he doesn't have an offspring. And he had tried to have a child, he did have a child through his slave woman, and um, God, he, God ultimately blessed that, but at first God rebuked him. And said, no, you will have a child by your wife, Sarah, according to the promise. And it goes on there in Romans to say that although Abraham, his body was uh, reckoned as dead. And um, Sarah's womb was considered barren. Uh, yet. He hoped in God and his faith grew as he gave glory to God. So he's up against an impossible situation. There's no way this promise of having a multitude of descendants, as many as the grains of the sand on the sea, or on the beach, sorry, without first having one child. There's no way it can happen. It's an impossible situation and only God can do it. Only God can bring the breakthrough. 
And of course, we know the end of that story that yes, supernaturally, they had a son. The Lord visited Abraham and said, this time next year, your wife will have a son. Call him Isaac. Another story too is where um, Joseph, and I talk about Joseph, Joseph a bit from time to time. I think there's a there's a lot in the life of Joseph for us as believers. There's a, there's a lot to take away from that, and of course he, um, God spoke to Joseph when he was 17 years old and um, gave him the promise of the sun, moon, and the stars bowing down to him, and that's of course his siblings along with his parents, um, but more than that, it symbolizes the cosmos that the world was in a way, going to bow down to Joseph. And the next thing Joseph knows is his, his brothers betray him. They throw him in a pit. Then they sell him into slavery. He goes off to a foreign uh, country where he um, exhibits his good character and serves the Lord, and it, he gets promoted um, for a brief while until his master's wife falsely accuses him of something and he gets thrown in the king's prison and even in the king's prison there uh, the Lord uses Joseph to interpret dreams and uh, one of the dreams that he interprets was as the king's cupbearer and the cupbearer and one of the dreams that he interprets uh, there is for the king's cupbearer um, this man had been uh, thrown into the king's prison the king had presumably become angry at him over some reason and he has a dream and uh, Joseph gives the interpretation to him and the interpretation is this that in three days time uh, you will find favor with the king once more and the king will restore you to your service uh, before him and so you can sort of see here if you read between the lines um, Joseph, who's got this promise from God way back when he was 17, he's now 30, um, is now standing in front of a man who's going to be standing before the king. And Joseph says to the cupbearer, he says, and when you stand before Pharaoh, make sure to remember me. And the Bible goes on to say that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph and Joseph uh, was in prison for two more years now the thing is that uh, after two more years uh, God gave a dream to Pharaoh of which no one in the whole kingdom could interpret and Joseph was called before Pharaoh and just to illustrate this point another time in one day a promise that was given to Joseph 13 years ago and his life took a very different direction to what the promise said. In one day, that promise was fulfilled. There was a great a breakthrough, a great a manifestation. And just from these uh, two previous things I've told you about Abraham and now about uh, Joseph, the key thing here is, is this. They both received promises they both chose to believe God and after some time they both tried to manufacture the outcome themselves. Uh, as previously said, uh, Abraham uh, tried to have a child through his slave woman because he couldn't see it happening uh, physically and uh, Joseph tries to get the ear of Pharaoh uh, through his own sort of cunning, if you like. And so you're still with me here listening. Uh, thank you. Um, just going to tie this together um, in a way that I think is going to uh, really encourage a lot of people. So against all hope, in hope, Abraham believed God and so became the father of many nations. All right. So if we're feeling hopeless and desperate and can't see a way out, what are we hoping for? What's our hope against hope? Well, 
for starters, I've written this down. I just want to read it out to you. I've written this. It is now ripe for God to choose to reveal himself as the father to many nations. And I really believe that. That God, um, I just think of this, there's a story in Matthew and it says that the people were taking their children to Jesus so that Jesus might lay hands on them and bless them. And the disciples, thinking they were doing a service, were turning these children and their parents, presumably, away. And Jesus uh, sees this and Jesus rebukes his disciples and says, Do not forbid uh, the children to come to me. For unless you humble yourself like a child, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of God. And of course, Jesus says somewhere else, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if we look at that illustration, it's a, it's a picture, it's a revelation of the Father. Uh, his children want to come to him. Um. And yet they they feel like they're 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 far away, um, and worse than that, um, people are giving them distorted images of God and blocking their path to the Father uh, to be blessed. Now, generally speaking, in this country over the last number of decades. Um, Faith in God and love for God and a willingness uh, to walk the ways of God, generally speaking, in our society and in our culture, has uh, gone backwards. We have moved uh, away from the Lord and away uh, from His ways. And what we're going through more and more is experiencing, as a society, experiencing the fruit of that. Now, God's response to that is, just like I said, is to be a father and to come to our society, to our neighborhoods, to our families as the father with open arms, not as the absent father, not as the abusive father, not as a, a tyrant, not as a a retributive judge, but to come as a good father bearing good gifts for his children. And just like the disciples were an obstruction, the Lord is now removing obstructions that are pre preventing people to know the father love of God, the father heart of of God for them and their family and everyone in their life. There's, there's a veil being removed. It's being taken off. And this, I truly believe, is, is the hope that God is going to uh, visit this nation for good. Not for evil, but for good. And the goodness that is about to visit this land is goodness that has never been known uh, since the beginning of time. You know, it says in Ephesians 1 in the Message Bible, it doesn't quite come out in the other translations, but it says this. It says, uh, The church is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. And I said before that generally this nation has departed uh, from the ways of God, you know, but just like uh, Elijah, after he had that victory in Mount Carmel, and then Jezebel threatened his life, and he ran, and he ran, and he ran, and um, at the end of his running, he encountered God, uh, and he said, he says to God twice, he says, God, I've, I've followed you with so much zeal uh, and yet um, 
my life is going to be taken from me. And earlier at the start of this visit video, I mentioned the people who feel like they've been serving God and serving God and serving God. And you've had so much zeal for God. And yet it feels like your very life force is being drained away. And you might even feel isolated and alone and feel like you've been serving God faithfully while you you look around and, and you're discouraged because you, you don't see that same sort of faithfulness in other people. And Elijah said to the Lord, he said, I am the only, only one left. And the Lord goes on in that conversation to say to Elijah, um, go anoint, you know, so-and-so as king and so-and-so as prophet, blah, blah, blah. But he says, for I have known 7,000 in the land of Israel uh, that have not bowed the knee or submitted to Baal. And even though we feel alone and we know that our society has drifted from God, there's a remnant, there's faithful people in this country, in our neighborhoods, in our churches who are trusting God faithfully, not leaning on their own understanding and not even aware that a breakthrough is coming, yet they're choosing to just trust God with everything they've got. But I want to tell you that this is ripe for the breakthrough of God. It is the time for the breakthrough of God. And if, you, if, if you're struggling to grapple with that, um, then I'll just leave that verse with you against all hope. So if you're feeling absolutely there's no way this is going to come to pass, that you've been told for so, so long, that God is going to intervene and break through in your own life um, or, you know, in, in, in our society, well, then I, I want to say, well, if you're feeling hopeless, well, this is prime time for the God of all hope um, to break through. And I really believe that this is, that scripture in Ephesians is, this is the time where the church in this nation is going to be the center of our society, not necessarily the institutional church, because there's a lot of problems with the institutional church, there's a lot of abuse with the institutional church. We could go on and on about that. But what I mean is the people of God, the people who love God and who trust God and humble themselves before God, this is going to be the prevailing culture in this nation. And the blessings. I don't even know what they look like, but the, the spirit testifies that it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And it's going to be suddenly. It's not going to be a slow thing. Just like uh, the droid army suddenly collapsed. Just like the Israelites after 430 years, uh, in one day, 2.4 million just walk out of slavery. How does that even happen? Just like Joseph in one day goes from the king's prison, forgotten by everybody, to becoming the second most powerful person in the powerful, most powerful nation on earth. There's a breakthrough happening for you in your life, and there's a breakthrough over this nation, and it is here. Keep going. It's going to be a miracle. I hope this has encouraged you today. God bless.